we're kind of backwards here because we got two computers. So this is this is everyone who's here on this camera. But it would probably be better if we use that one's probably get a better maybe. Okay, I'm good. Okay, so um, the idea was to talk about online teaching today. We can do that like as opposed to yesterday, or or we can talk about just what it's like to teach online today. So um, let's go around and have everybody say hi. I sort of introduced the facilitators at each place. Um, from our angle right now, we're seeing Norm Wright on the screen, and Norm Wright is in the Pedagogy First uh, Pod Certificate class. He's also in DS106, and gosh knows what else you're involved in, Norm. <laughs> um, okay, let me have people introduce themselves here. The cameras that's filming us is right there. Hi, Becky. I teach Japanese, but it's not an online course, but I wanted to come. Oh, that's fine. Mm -hmm. Good I teach cultural anthropology. It's been for a while. Terry Sprague, and I'm teaching an online dance history class, and I'm being a test pilot for the Camtasia Relay software. And it's been um, interesting. <laughs> <laughs> We've had a couple of um, crises, but oh, I haven't tried it yet. So. <laughs> Uh, my name is Jim Julius. I'm the faculty director for online ed here at Miracles. I'm new, so I'm non classroom <laughs> faculty. And I'm Laura Kachorik, and I teach child development, and I have one online class here. And Ted, are we able to hear you and your people at all? <laughs> no. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh, we're getting a static. Do you know uh, hand signals? Or? We can't hear you guys at all in Alabama. It's just static is all we're getting. And he's introducing someone and everything. Alabama static. Alabama is just static. We can't hear you guys. Can you hear us? Oh, no. Ted, do you have a headset or something you can plug in and share? Maybe you guys can sit together at the desk or something. Sounds like someone wants to talk to you at Folsom Lake College. Hmm? Read Zach's chat. Oh, sounds good. Yeah. Have them come talk to me. <laughs> learn a lot from them. No, no headset, no sound in Alabama. Can you hear us? You can hear us. Oh dear. Okay. Well, we cannot hear you. And we don't know why, so maybe somebody could, could use the chat if you don't have a, a headset or don't want to come in. And, ah, you're typing. Okay. All right. Great. <laughs> Okay, so how many people in this group have have been teaching online recently? Laura has, I have, Todd has, Zach has. Okay. Uh, no, we didn't hear when you turned off the speakers, and we only heard static when you turned on whatever you turned on there, Ted. So... I think we're right in the middle of one of the things that has affected online teaching. Um, a lot of people, when we started all this, we were teaching asynchronous everything, right? I mean, posting things in Blackboard or some kind of space before there was Blackboard, and then students were doing their work on their own <coughs> asynchronously. And now we have tools like this, which, however imperfect... Hello! Hi, hey, Gino. We were just starting our conversation about this particular technology and how it can impact um, online teaching for people who want to do more synchronous activities. I see. So nice to see you. And Hi. okay, and Ted is introducing Michael Carr from theater, so he should be able to gesture broadly. 
in order to participate. <laughs> yes. Okay, good. <laughs> Excellent. Pantomime. In pantomime. A lot of people think that the, the reason this is a good thing is because we all get together at the same time. But of course, the disadvantage is that uh, students in general might expect an asynchronous experience. And unless the entire class is offered synchronously, where you meet every single week at a particular time, might be kind of unaccustomed to this. Is anybody dealing with that or looking into creating more synchronous experiences with their students? Things like I've this? tried uh, um, synchronous office hours, and I've gotten pretty much zero response from my students or zero involvement. Uh, it could be a technology issue, you know, based on you know where I teach and the availability of technology to students. Where are you uh, at? I teach with Todd uh, at a community college in Arizona, in northern Arizona. So there's a different a real different population of students compared to like a university and um, uh, I think that might have something to do with it. Uh, I'm not sure how comfortable students are sometimes uh, doing something like that new. I don't know. Is it, is it new to people? I mean I'm not sure how, how widespread are things like Skype and using the telephones, the cell phones to be able to talk to people synchronously with camera? Is that as prevalent as the geeky people think it is? <laughs> maybe, maybe not with one with, with their peers, but maybe with their instructors, it's kind of new and weird, I guess. Because <laughs> I was in in a classroom uh, last semester, and we had uh, students who were out sick. They sort of cascaded through being out sick, and at at one point, I started bringing in my laptop and using Tiny Chat to broadcast the class for people who were home sick and at one day it didn't work very well and one of my students said well why aren't you using Skype I said oh well I I could use Skype and then I sort of looked around the room at 30 people and said do you all use Skype and they went oh yeah everybody's got Skype mm -hmm. but oh well we're kind of using the wrong technology then here because if everybody has Skype maybe maybe they could be using that so are you putting your office hours in Blackboard or somewhere well, else I think I think one of the uh, issues is really a technology thing. It's I'm using Blackboard Collaborate, and it's just not opening up a Skype window and logging in. You know, it's it's a little bit more to it than that, and um, that might be one of the impediments, I guess, for some students. Um, Todd, what, what do you think? You're on you're on our campus. Um, you know, I I. I think it'll be a slow, a slow go with Collaborate, but I think it'll be even slower if we don't try. And I think that, um, you know, part of selling anything is kind of that, this is our tool, this is our product, this is what we're going to use. And, um, you know, at this point, it's all new to every, all of us. So um, I was just going to point out uh, that there is a woman down in uh, Scottsdale or Maricopa Community College District who is having a great deal of success with Google Hangouts and her uh, hybrid class. Uh, she claims that it's, work, it's working for her to do synchronous events and office hours and stuff like that. Um, but you know, I think it's all pretty new. Someday, this will be That's is, what I think. Is she scheduling them? Just regularly? I, I, I don't mean, know much about it. I was just, as you guys were talking, I was just looking for where she had said that, and I was going to copy and paste her, um, her text okay. in this thing. But um, it's Michelle, she teaches art classes down at the Maricopa schools. Um, Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I was going to share. Uh, um, at San Diego State, we started doing hybrid courses that did synchronous sessions using Wimba, which is one of the precursors to collaborate back in 2007 and a lot of the faculty that first started using the Wimba classroom were convinced that it was going to be a nightmare for the students because there was a big learning curve for faculty and even in 2007 students were fine and when we started doing fully online classes a couple years later a lot of faculty decided to be very heavily synchronous and um, most faculty didn't require students to be present in the synchronous sessions, but they recorded them 
so that then students that weren't able to be present could watch later. And um, so a couple things about that. One of the pieces of feedback that some of the faculty were looking for was, is it better to record a live interactive session and make that available, or is it better to sort of pre-create something and share that? And students overwhelmingly preferred something that was created with other students present because they liked the, the interaction, even if they weren't partaking in it. Mm -hmm. They sort of vicariously were able to benefit from the questions that were asked and the interaction that went on. Um, another thing is that faculty wanted to do um, office hours live, and even in these classes where students were showing up for synchronous online sessions, it was very rare for students to show up for live online office hours. So I don't think that's a technology issue or a, sync or a time issue. I just think that is an office hours issue. I mean, most faculty struggle in general with people coming to office hours. So I don't think that necessarily changes by making it available online, even if you're doing a lot of other things online with your students. Um, so just a couple of things from, from past experience. I do think students, I think what Todd said is really right. I mean, you, you, you kind of, if you nibble around the edges for too long, you start to feel like you're never going to take the full bite and no one's going to get full. You really do have to just kind of jump in at some point and say, this is a part of the class. It's an expectation. And quickly, I think people will come up to speed as they need to to make it work. And, and individually, it can work separately because I use the, um, you know, the Google Talkback badge that where I can put that I'm in um, when I'm in my mail. And so the little light turns green on all my classes. The front page of all my classes has that. So if they're in the class and they're looking for me and they see the little green light, it's, it's, not, it's not perfect. They don't have to be logged in. They don't have to have Google. They don't have to have anything turned on. But if they click on that, it brings up a chat window. And I'm sitting right there. The first time students use this, they're just astonished. It's like, I can't believe you're there. It's like, oh, yeah, I'm here. I'm real. And everything. What can I do for you? <laughs> and they love it. And they come back. Once they do it once, they come back. And so I don't even necessarily have that scheduled. Right. It's just if I'm in the mail and I have it on and they happen to be on, and they think it's really cool. So I don't, I guess that's not officially office hours. I think it should be. I mean, I think if you just make yourself available at the moment when a question strikes rather than making them sort mm -hmm. of save it up for the once a week that you advertise as being online, that's, it's a whole different thing. They could thing. even be feeling pressure, right, to show up. You know, if yeah. it's, if you're saying, oh, Wednesday at 11 or my office hours and then they may think, well, I'm going to be, what if I'm the only person there? I'm going to have to, like, talk by myself to the teacher, or what if, you know? <laughs> I mean, that could be scary. I don't know, Gino, do you think you'd be scary to talk to one-on-one? -on -one? <laughs> of course. <laughs> okay. So uh, it might be, or they're, or they're worried that there, you know, there'll only be a few of them, or that there'll be a mob, and they won't have anything to say, or whatever. Um, yeah. Yeah, it, that's a tough call. Because even in your what, office, you're supposed your, to be one-on-one. What on is one. the tool you used before? You mentioned that's um, this is pops up. This is a, it, they call, it's really a nasty thing to find in Google. It's not right up there where it should be. But it's called the Talk Back Badge. And it's a little piece of code that just shows that your, your Gmail chat, your G chat, is that you're available. If you are logged into your Google account, just Google Talkback badge, and you'll it'll give you the page that has the code in it if you're logged in already. So. Well, it sounds like the studio would have to be logged into their Gmail uh, account. No, no, no. That's yeah. what the badge is for. Because what the badge is is code that just shows whether you're online or not, oh. and it it gives them a link that just brings up an anonymous chat window in the middle of whatever they're doing. You need that. I need the Gmail. Right. The person who wants to do it needs to have a Google Chat open. In mine, it's just a little widget on the side of the Gmail, so I'm there anyway. I'm logged in anyway. I just have to make sure I'm visible. And the little light turns green. And, 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 how, do they, and how, do they get, how do they find out that I'm actually active? Well, you put, it, you put that piece of code wherever you think they're going to go. So some people put it on the front of their Blackboard class, some people put it on their home page, I put it on the I front see. page of my class, which is just a web page. Um, yeah, you can put it anywhere you want to. I could even, I could stick it on every single page. So if they had a question, you know, if I wanted to, I could put it inside every lecture. And then if they're in there, and I'm on, they could, they could find me.
Oh, Are they okay. able to see you? Huh? They can't see me. They see the, They see my name. They say chat with Lisa is what I put. You can put just in whatever chat. text you want. Chat. So I just wrote chat with Lisa, and it's oh. the light. There's a little circle next to my name, and mm -hmm. it turns green. Okay. And when light I'm not chat. there, yeah, when I'm not there, it's grayed out. Okay. I have two success stories uh, with chat clients. Uh, one is uh, Involve, which is a widget for WordPress sites that allows you to chat. Um, had to follow you. Um, the other one is, and the teacher who used that told me after he put it on his site that his email had definitely been reduced because students could just go to his site, type in a question, and, and oftentimes other students were, would uh, answer it. Um, involve, E N V O L V E. It's the, um, you can see it in action at um, the site. Um, the other one is Mebo. Uh, Mebo is, is uh, I have a teacher who teaches Second Life, so her students are probably a little more uh, digitally literate, maybe, but um, she has great success with Mebo 24 hours a day, and uh, as far as accessing her when she's online, um, because it can also just, her client can kind of lay on top of her uh, desktop, so whatever she's doing, if she's online and her students see that, um, she can, you know, converse with them there. And, and the last one would be um, uh, that article I sent you a minute ago with, uh, or put in the chat there, mm -hmm. from Elisa Cooper down in Phoenix. Hers, she doesn't really care about the tool. She just wants to be contacted. So she's like, Google Voice, you know, text me, whatever, as long as it's before 9 o'clock at night. And... Um, you know, she's a fairly open kind of personality, so I feel like in her teaching spaces, her students go, oh, she is very approachable. I will, I will send her a chat, and I will ask her a question, and I think that it works pretty good for her. Down in the Maricopa schools, they're actually, if you read that little post she wrote, they're actually considering uh, or in the process of making it um, like a requirement for teachers to do uh, virtual office hours. Or synchronous office hours. They'll find Person probably can. like, well, like many of us have that when you set it up deliberately, the office hour in a space that people don't necessarily show up because the feeling I'm getting is the things that seem to work the best are sort of the ad hoc things that are like what students are doing normally, like they'd normally text somebody or they'd normally do IM with somebody. So if they can do that with the teacher, they're, they're delighted to talk to you. But if they have to go to a separate space at a separate time and log in and sign in and do all that, it's too much trouble to just ask a question. Yeah, it, I could see it for a class session where you're giving a presentation. But if you're going to do that, you might as well record it, like you say, and post it. Zach, are you doing anything synchronous up there? No. <laughs> <clears throat> and the short answer would be not office hours or nobody's chatting or SMS or... Yeah, people do that, but nobody wants to go. It's a, it's a pretty common experience that we've heard already. Is that the schedule? Is, do you think it's the scheduled thing? Are there people doing unscheduled stuff that's working? Because that's I'm getting a feeling that's the pattern. Yeah, I mean, we a lot of our faculty will do text. Um, and answer those at whatever time. Yeah, it's the scheduling I think that people are nervous about. Or not nervous, but it doesn't match with people's lives. Very well. well, there is sort of a contradiction. You know, if people think that the purpose of online classes is to be convenient to their schedule, and then you say office hours are, you know, Tuesday at 6, well, if that's not convenient to their schedule, then that's that's just not going to happen. So the you lose the advantage of the asynchronous format when you schedule synchronous things. Now, if it's scheduled into the class, I know Jim's got some experience with this. If the class is actually scheduled to be online mm -hmm. at these times, I assume you don't have those kind of problems. Right. For sure. Um, but that really requires that you communicate that up front so students know what they're getting into, what they're signing up for. And, you know, the experience with that at San Diego State was they were mostly very traditional age college students that were taking these courses in addition to taking a lot of uh, on-ground classes on right. campus. So 
it really actually, they, it was probably more useful for them to have scheduled time so it paralleled the rest of their experience with their classes compared to a student that's only taking one or two online classes and has a crazy life outside of that. You know, different situations for sure. How about scheduling and the end uh, by appointment? Some of my students, the schedule doesn't work, but they email me ahead of time. Mm -hmm. And if I can be available, I tell them, meet me, whatever this is, mm -hmm. we can chat, and we communicate that way. Mm -hmm. And it works, kind of. Yeah, that, so that's using email as sort of the yeah. basic communication to say, can we Skype at 6? Yeah. You know, yeah, that, that would work as well. And that involves a little more effort, right, yeah. on the part of the student to but say, the, let's schedule time, but it yeah. means they get their own time. Mm -hmm. There's also features like in the Google Calendar now where you mm -hmm. can set up little blocks of time where I'll be available in this time. Students can go in and request an appointment, okay. and it fills that slot in the yeah. calendar, so that's even less work potentially than doing email back and forth for this time work. Yes, it will. Sure. You'll just see your calendar and, and request what an appointment. What is that, Google? It's in Google Calendar, yeah, okay. if you explore the appointment feature. How many, how many of us use something like a Google Calendar to help students stay on track? Because if we can segue out of the synchronous thing, the biggest problem I think I've been having this semester is the online students sticking to the schedule that I've set, that it's not enough to have it on a web page or say, well, here's the assignment dates. I've created a Google Calendar with the dates on it, but I don't get the feeling very many of them use it. In mm -hmm. fact, I was, I was in class the other day and one student, we were sitting in a circle and one student, she's on her iPad and she's, she says, well, I just keep missing these, you know, I can't seem to remember that the forum post is always due Wednesday night. And I said, well, you know, I've got a little Google calendar there that you can download or use if you want to do that. And she said, no. And I said, well, how do you, you've got to be taking other classes, right? She says, yeah. I said, okay, well, how do you remember what's due? in all of your classes. And she took her iPad and she turned it around and it had scrawled in obviously her finger, you know, <laughs> test due Tuesday. Wow. I said, ah, I said, no planner or, and she's, <laughs> I didn't get a feeling that was a rare thing. Everybody in the room kind of went, you know, and and so I wonder, a lot of these things like Google Calendar that seem to us, well, it's so obvious. I mean, you would put all your classes in there, right? Mm -hmm. Wouldn't it have been nice if we'd had this, right? You put all your classes in there, and then you know what deadlines are coming up. I've got the Google Calendar running in all my classes, so it says what's, what's there for me to grade and when. Are people using it, though? Are students using this stuff? Mm -hmm. I think maybe part of it is just where is the calendar? Like, if you have to click three times or exactly. even twice to find it, I'm not going to go look. No, I'm not going to no. see it, you know? And I wonder if having it, it might be used more if it's, like, right in the front of everything. Um, well, it's in the, mine is in a widget on the main page of the class. I mean, the place where you go to, to start working, it's right there in a box on the side. But I, I'm not sure that's making any difference. Mm -hmm. It's just if they're using different ways to organize their lives, then we're using to organize our workspaces and our classes. There may be a bigger gap there than anybody really is acknowledging right now. I think they are instant everything. Right. Instant. That's why they are emailing right away with their phone now. Well, not yeah. They don't need their computer. And you get the email, you respond right away, you set up a time, they're happier. Well, that's a, that's a good argument for SMS systems that exactly. send them a text that exactly. says your test is due tonight. Yeah, is that what, what I was thinking, yeah. yeah. There are plenty of companies that want to sell us systems like that. But oh, you don't have to. Have there's free stuff. The and there is certainly uh, ways to do it without buying into something. Well, my, the Google Calendar has a way yeah. to get it, but you have to do it. The student has to say, to I want, yeah, Facebook. it has to subscribe and mm -hmm. say, I want the alerts from this calendar sent to my phone. Right. And then they put in their phone number, and I give them a link yeah. to do that, but they don't, they want it pushed yeah. to them somehow. Well, it's about as push as you can get. I mean, you have to <laughs> sign up for the push, but still. Yeah. <laughs> what are other people's experiences with keeping track and students keeping track of what they're doing online? 
I use uh, Google Docs and um, I create a like a, um, a word processing document with the schedule, and I update that. I, like at the end of class, I'll show them. It. Well, when we start class, I'll show them over that, and when we end class, I'll highlight what we've done. And that link is available to them through, you know, Blackboard and other means, so they can always access that sort of real-time schedule. Some students seem to like that, and um, I also keep, I also use Google Docs for uh, attendance tracking. I can just send the link to student services for, you know, reasons that they need to track students. So that's kind of neat. Hmm. I think maybe one of the issues is just every faculty member might have a slightly different system. So again, yeah, yeah. it kind of goes back to Todd's point that in some ways, some, some types of systems, it's great to have a diversity of things that faculty do with their students, but in some things like this, if every faculty member is doing something different, it probably really decreases the likelihood that students are going to figure it out and make use of it. Which great. They, they, I think that they have to acclimate then to a, a whole <coughs> other set of tools when they go to an, another class. Mm -hmm. and so if they're taking three classes and there's three different ways of accessing information, I, and then the, the, the next semester there's new ways of doing it, it's kind of mind-boggling, I guess, for them, and almost tedious to keep track of every, what, the, way, the way their instructors are you know, conveying information to them. But we had to do that. I mean, every syllabus I got handed wasn't the same. Some were two pages long, and <clears throat> excuse me, some just had the schedule, and others were like eight pages long and had massive descriptions for every week of what I was supposed to do. And I had to. But it was still a matter of just taking that and writing the dates in a calendar. You mm -hmm. didn't have all these other devices and other <clears throat> sort of ways well, of doing can, things. Well, you can you can right? still do that. Yeah, you can. Yeah, you can still take it and put it all in the calendar. You could, and I'm sure there are. Three or four students that do. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe they're counting on the systems to somehow keep track for them in a way that they don't yeah. automatically do. Yeah. I, I just sense there's a big gap between yeah. what we think we're doing and what they think we're doing. Well, I think our experience when we went to school, obviously, <clears> is way <throat> different in many, many ways. Uh, than their experience, so, you know, I, I, you know, it's like they, they, they can do the work, they're, they're bright students, I think, but many times I get the impression that they want things as convenient as possible, and, um, you know, unless, like, like Todd said, unless, if you have to, if you have them to go through pressing more than two or three buttons, mm -hmm. forget about it, you're going to lose them. So how do we deal with that? Yeah, it's tough. <laughs> That's the, hence hence the problem. <laughs> well, I I think that that um, there like the polar opposites are okay. Everybody who ever goes to school from now on is going to use Blackboard, and all the shells will have green buttons on the left, <laughs> you know, Arial twelve font fonts on the right. Um, and all the syllabuses will be in the first button, and all the discussion <laughs> forums will start off with class introductions, you know, I mean... You're giving me nightmares, man. I know, well, what are those, you know, kind of polar opposites, and which way do we want to go? And I, you don't have to go too, all the way to one or the other, obviously, but I think that the Internet says, and, and, the, and the diversity of tools and all that, it really mirrors exactly what schools are like and classrooms are like and learners are like and, and textbooks and chalkboard locations in classrooms and homework assignments. I mean, it's all different stuff. Hardly any of it's really the same, except maybe the teachers in the front of the room, I mean, or, you know, <laughs> sometimes. So I think that, that, you know, part of the struggle that we're discussing right now is just growth pains of, you know, oh my gosh, you know, I got to now use a, a manual transmission instead of a uh, automatic, you know, and this is really freaking me out. And, so, and it is, it's freaking everybody out. So um, but that's a good I don't know, I, I, I would prefer to, to <clears throat> forge ahead without leaving the, the, the students, you know, in our wake, um, forge ahead with 
with experiments and trying things to see what some of what I, I think we understand the internet can provide for us. Um, I got I know my 14 year old daughter, and if, if she goes into a, there are some things teachers are doing that are just going to make her go. This is not what the internet's for, mm. you know. It's it's something bigger and better and more. It's a, it's a more powerful tool that I I use it in a way that is bigger than this or something. Is that an argument for web immersion? You know, making sure that everybody spends enough time on the web that they are comfortable switching from format to format, from platform to platform? I would say they should all have to go on more field trips first. <laughs> and then, <clears throat> then we go on the internet part. But, you know, balance. It's all balance, right? Ted, you have a headset. And we still <laughs> can't hear you. <laughs> Can anyone hear Ted, or is it just us that can't hear? No, I cannot hear him. No one can again. hear you. And we even see your little green gauge going. And we still can't hear you. Monty Bing is cursed. <laughs> You're a funny guy, Zach Dahl. <laughs> Oh boy. That's why he's in black and white. For being wry. If people in general, it's been my experience, don't spend a lot of time on the web, and that includes faculty as well as students, they have more trouble with anything that's new in an online space. So that if we've got students who spend a lot of time with their individual devices, with their phones, and this kind of thing, they're comfortable there. They're comfortable in Facebook. Some of them, obviously, are comfortable in Skype. They might be comfortable at Amazon or, I mean, wherever they shop online. And then they've got this classroom space. And if they think of that as being Blackboard, or being Moodle, or being Canvas, which I agree, Ted, is also pretty standardized because they won't even let you change the buttons in Canvas. Um, then there's this gap there where Todd's world of the internet and exploring the internet is somehow being jumped over. You know, you've kind of got on the one side them using their personal devices and knowing how to get what they want from their social life and their shopping life, and but their education is seen to be in a closed space, and we're missing the stuff in the middle. Now I know some have, have met people. I'm sorry, Lisa. Have met people had success with um, uh, Facebook, getting to students through Facebook and having their office hours or chat sessions through that. I've I've tried it this time myself for the first first time this semester. I took all my students because what was annoying me was that they'd all have the same question in six different class sections. And so even if you've got like a FAQ or a help forum or something, I was still doing it six different times. <laughs> so I offered a Facebook group for all my history students, all six sections of them. And I'd say about, about half, of the, half of them signed in. And they do. They talk to each other and they answer their questions faster than I'd get to them anyway. And some of them are posting, like they're working on theses right now and they're posting them. And other students are, they seem to feel a little more comfortable responding to each other in that space than they do responding to each other in the Moodle forum I set up for them to do that in. Yeah, I think you hit a point before about what do they what do they use the most? Their personal devices, what do they do in their, what do they use in their social life? What do they do mostly? And those things are we have to look at I think it's important to look at that um, instead of trying to maybe ask them to do it Maybe our way, I guess. Yeah. We have to maybe do it their way if we want to get to them outside of class. <laughs> well, inside of Facebook, this group tried it out once. I don't remember which of us were in there. Todd probably remembers when we tried Hoot. But that's, yeah. 
I can't hear you, Todd, now. Uh-oh. Oh, that was, sorry. Oh, that's okay. My Ted said. Your Ted um, <laughs> Oh, God, we're going to have a running gag for a year. I can't wait. Uh, so, the, um, yeah, that, you know, that kind of environment, I think, I mean, just like what we're doing here, you know, some sometime in the near future, this is this is what your online office hours will look like. Uh, it'll be a click. It'll be in a Facebook place, and or it'll be a link from Facebook because when you're in there, it'll show up in Facebook, and uh, somehow your privacy will be protected. Real tricky stuff. And um, that boot was interesting. That was a that was a good one. That was interesting because what happened? I think I think three of us were in there who are here now. Um, we we got into it's an application inside of Facebook called Hoot, and we all got into it to try to have a synchronous meeting. It looks kind of like this, right? I mean, it's just basically like this with webcams and and uh, while we were talking and trying it out, the guy who developed it, well, the two kids who developed it, mm -hmm. came in and joined us and said, <laughs> "Hi, what do you think of our product?" <laughs> you know, and uh, asked us if there were any features we needed and. And they were working on it right now, and so we mentioned one, I forget what it was, and they said, oh yeah, we'll have that done by Tuesday. It was a, it was a very different sort of experience than Blackboard, that's for sure, um, or any place else we'd ever been. And it worked, you know, technically. It worked darn well. I was impressed. I haven't used it, but I'm thinking about Gino's issue and wondering um, whether that wouldn't be the place for the office hours. Not a... Uh or team speak, you know, we commissioned a, our, our research office at Los Rios uh, did a, a study about student communication and I advocated strongly to get uh, gaming consoles, Xbox 360, PS3, and it turns out about close to 50% of our students, within, we had an end of about 700 in the, the research, um, have gaming consoles, which is more than have iPads, Kindles, Nooks, Galaxy tabs combined by about three three times more than all the rest of those combined, and about the same number that have landline phones. No, there's a lot of stuff that can work on those. Landline phones or no, PS3? no, no. The the, the uh, Xbox, right? That can be connected up to a lot yeah, of things I mean, that we can. The, the vision that Microsoft and others had for this being the central device of the living room is is sort of is finally sort of becoming. Um, true with the HBO deal with Xbox, with Netflix on the Wii and on the PS3 and on the, you know what I mean? So I think that some of the natural conclusions we ought to be considering. You have that study somewhere, like, you know, print? Yeah, I'll or dig it up. E emailable? I'll dig it up. I'd love to see that because, you know, if we're designing for the wrong venue, the wrong devices, the, if we're, if we're putting stuff out there and then they're going home and looking at it on their television. Well, I, so we just did a survey here that just yeah. closed. We had over 700 responses. And um, I, the, one of the questions was, which devices do you mm. frequently or sometimes use to access course materials or content? The um, highest was a laptop, second highest was a desktop, but over 50% including a, like more than a third that said frequently it was a smartphone. Said that, that the, that's the device they're using to access materials, um, course materials and activities. So, you know, even more, much more so, I, the, uh, there were also options for tablets and e-reader devices and other, and everything else was, you know, lower than 15%. But that... I was surprised how high it was that people answered smartphones. Oh, that means that's bad because that means I have to get one to look see what my classes look like. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I, I don't think that's a bad. In fact, we had similar finding. The, accessing the LMS was the. It's quite, yeah, I think it's the, the number one thing that people wanted or wished to access on their smart uh, device. Second was class schedules, and third was enrollment services. But once they get into, I mean, how well do these LMSs work on on a smartphone? It depends. You know, WordPress works really well on a smartphone. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but that wasn't know, quite what I meant. Been, <laughs> the vendors have been kind of nibbling at that. P2L is not great, but uh, 
I don't know. To your point, though, I, I a couple of years ago, I I did exactly that, Lisa, and I got uh, the college to get me, at the time, a BlackBerry, an iPhone 4, an Android phone, <laughs> and an iPad. Attention. I wrote an exhaustive uh, <laughs> proposal because I think it's important to to look at, and we, we sort of were talking about, uh, still talking about doing a comprehensive um, top-to-bottom review of all points of contact with students in the institution and to what extent those are available and accessible on mobile devices. And and to the to the gaming console point, I was talking with the web guy, and he says that um, the user agent browsers from um, from game consoles are creeping up in the in the stats. Hmm. This takes me back to the telecourse days, man. People sitting on their living room couch taking the class. There's something very old about that. <laughs> Different controller, though, I guess. So what happens when a student takes their smartphone and logs into Blackboard that hasn't, like in Ted's case, paid for the special mobile app? They lose their eyesight. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The phone explodes. What, I mean, what? trying to zoom in on the it, regular. Uh, yeah, it, it really depends on which phone, because, I mean, so, to speak a little bit to Ted's point, Blackboard. If you're on an iOS device or if you're on the Sprint network, then you have access for free to the Blackboard app that gives you mm. a little bit nicer access. But the Blackboard <laughs> app doesn't have full, it, it, it's not as rich as if you just were able to actually get in through the web and, and have all the interaction. It's much more limited. Um, but yeah, then if you want more than that, if you want the rest of your students that aren't on iOS or Sprint, um, you have to pay Blackboard an awful lot mm -hmm. for them to have access. And it's still far from, far from great. But, you know, Blackboard has so much Java built in that it really depends how well your phone handles that to to, to uh, whether it'll work or not. Because it makes me wonder whether students, you know, when they answer that survey and they say, well, I'm using this to access course materials, it makes me wonder whether they switch when the stakes are higher. In other words, if, if I had a smartphone, I wouldn't mind, you know, maybe listening to the lectures or reading some material or checking what date some things do, but if I have to take an exam, I'm going to use my desktop. You know, and it, it makes me wonder if, if, because my, my course is, is separated this semester. I've got all of my lectures and my syllabus and all the information stuff outside the learning management system. So on a phone, that probably looks okay as a standard web page, maybe. And then, you know, inside, I have no idea what that would look like if they tried to take an exam on their phone. Boy, do we think teachers really want to think about this stuff? Well, yeah, I mean, this, of course, <laughs> is the promise of HTML5, that as everything on the web switches over, it should play much more nicely with all the different devices, but it's going to take a while for course management systems to get there. Do we want teachers who don't want to think about those things? Well, you've got teachers who don't want to think about <laughs> yeah, those things. You don't have a choice. But, I mean, it ends up being a good argument if the LMS catches up to the phones, then it ends up being another good argument for using the LMS, which then standardizes the student experience, whether it's on the phone or on the Xbox or whatever. And we're kind of back to the things we were trying to avoid, teaching them skills of, of doing things elsewhere. D2L did a funny thing. They put an app in the App Store for, I think it was for Gradebook. That you, I think you had to pay 99 cents, but it only works if your institution turns on <laughs> um, that thing on the server side. So. Oh. <laughs> I wonder how many 99 cent nothings they've gotten yeah. money for. Yeah, we didn't turn it on. So you said mean. <laughs> and it's funny, on, on the BlackBerry, Blackboard used to have, was it Blackboard or D2L? No, it must have been D2L because that's Canadian, right? And there were a couple of different D2L apps that you could download for a BlackBerry. One was a grading app and one was something else. So they kind of parted out specific functionality from an instructor perspective. And you could grab those pieces and, and do those things. Hmm. Dipali wants me to say hi to everybody. You can wave, Dipali, and they can see you. <laughs> say hi to Dipali. Yeah. We can see yeah. you. Yeah, 
I'm here twice. Because yeah. I'm recording. <laughs> where is she? Where are you? Where are you at, Dipali? Yes. Where are you? I'm not in on campus, and Jennifer is there. Unfortunately, right there, right here. <laughs> so you guys are up. Uh, where are you? You're up here near. I thought Jen was uh, somewhere near Palomar. She's nodding. We can't hear Jen. Oh no, she's talking. We can't hear her. That's kind of the theme this morning. If you feel like you're not being heard, you're not. Put on a headset. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Got to move faster to beat Zach. What other issues are people interested in talking about in like the next couple of minutes that that relate to ways in which online teaching is changing now or is different now than it used to be? Certainly, we've covered two big ones, right? Uh, synchronous communications, mobile devices, how they're getting the stuff. Uh, can I just put out a request for information? If anybody at your institution is we're working on a kind of a 50-50 blended transfer academy, CSU general ed transfer block scheduling to essentially give students four classes in the space of two time blocks. Is anyone doing anything like that? If you are, please contact me and tell me what you're doing. You're doing cohorts? Yeah. I think oh. Because in our district, people have done various things, but they, they do this, but they do it by crunching all the courses into eight weeks, one and two, and that kind of thing. And I think it's much more humane to do them as 50-50 blended over the full 16 semester. Right. No, that, that makes sense. We have not done cohorts here in about uh, 16, 17 years. And when we did, it was connected to the honors program, and it, it was not necessarily connected directly to university transfer. We had all sorts of stuff then, team teaching and, and that kind of stuff, and now we're back to pretty much standard everything. <laughs> back in the hippie days. <laughs> yeah, well, back when people were willing to try different formats and experiment a little bit. Yeah, you know. well, in classrooms, right? <laughs> she doesn't go in classrooms. I went to high school in a place that had, you know, we were all, all the buildings were geometrically shaped and the walls all moved. Mm -hmm. I went to an uh, elementary school that had the library in the center, and every room only had three walls, yep. and the, the center was open. That's, all, every, yep. every room, all the way around the circle. Me too. Wow. Okay, well, this explains why we're all so innovative. Yeah. Okay. okay. <laughs> Nobody went to a brownstone high school with stairs and <laughs> traditional rooms, and everybody closed off from everybody? Oh, well. Yeah, that explains a lot. <laughs> I guess if we want to create the better environments for our students to come out of and be more innovative, then it would be better if we don't get stuck inside the, the hallway boxes, even online. Well, I, I, would, I don't have any topic about education beyond what we're doing right now, because it is almost time to go. Yep. I just got my boss to buy me this. Ooh. Very flashy. But, um... What is exciting is that uh, we're all together in one space, I think, and that really is uh, a, a step in a good direction, you know, and I think that, uh, I know Gino here, uh, I don't know that he's used Hangouts much, and he certainly probably has not hung out in like a virtual space like this um, with other teachers, and, and I think that's good stuff, and I think uh, Lisa's doing an awesome job of pushing this forward with us. How do you put that book on your Kindle? <laughs> <laughs> My daughter has a Kindle Fire, but I don't. Right. I'm stuck with like this ancient droid phone. That I don't want to talk about it. So you need to I date. like books, and it's okay yeah. to like books anyway. I like books too. But see, Zach got his school to buy him four different mobile devices, so Todd, we're doing something wrong. Yeah, well, that was back in the salad days. <laughs> oh, was it? <laughs> Well, thanks, everybody, for uh, coming today. And I feel so bad that we can't hear Ted, no matter what he does over there, Ted said or not. I'm so sorry, Ted. Maybe next time you should start it, and then you'll be in charge, and you can, like, kick everybody out and come back in if you have to.
<laughs> Where do you hear Ted all the time, Todd? In your head? Yeah, right? <laughs> I thought so. It was nice to meet everybody, and I want to thank the folks here for coming and, and there and everywhere. And if I've done this properly, we might even have a recording of this. We'll have to see what happens.